reading through um, the book of First Peter recently, I looked um, at chapter three at a couple of the questions here, and I thought that it would be fun for us to look at it tonight, too. Um, I want to start reading in verse number eight of First Peter three. Finally, all of you be harmonious, sympathetic, affectionate, compassionate and humble. Do not return evil for evil or insult for insult, but instead bless others. And because you were called to inherit a blessing for the one who wants to love life and see good days, must keep his tongue from evil and his lips from uttering deceit. And he must turn away from evil and do good. He must seek peace and pursue it. For the eyes of the Lord are upon the righteous and his ears are open to their prayer. But the Lord's face is against those who do evil. For who is going to harm you if you are devoted to what is good? But in fact, if you happen to suffer for doing what is right, you are blessed. But do not be terrified of them or be shaken, but set Christ apart as Lord in your hearts. And always be ready to give an answer to everyone who asks about the hope you possess. Yet do it with courtesy and respect, keeping a good conscience so that those who slander your good conduct in Christ may be put to shame when they accuse you. For it is better to suffer for doing good if God wills it than for doing evil. Let's pray. Lord God, we love you. God, we're thankful for your goodness. Lord, we're thankful to be able to have a place to be able to gather and to worship you on Sunday night. Lord, I pray that you would just meet with us as we do look at your word. I do pray, God, that you would just... um, by your power, that you would just allow us to know you more, to be able to uh, relate more to the sufferings of Christ, Lord. And God, I pray that you just make us faithful. In Jesus' name, amen. Um, if you're familiar with the book of First Peter, uh, the book of First Peter, it teaches us how to suffer. It teaches us how to be submissive. Um, that's what has, uh, Peter has taught us so far in these first couple of chapters. And then in chapter 3, um, looking specifically uh, at the wives, being submissive to the husbands. After he covers that, he goes into this next section right here of suffering for doing good. And I find it very interesting, the question that is asked in verse number 13. Because it says, for who is going to harm you if you are devoted to what is good? There's a couple of different ways that you can answer this question. Um, The first way that you can answer it, it could be no one. Who's going to harm you if you're devoted to to doing good? It could be no one. Uh, Some people see this question that Peter asked right here as if it is just a a general uh, truism, like a a philosophical thought. Who's going to harm you? Uh, What are the what is the average? You know, if you are going to be good to to people, what's the chances of them being bad to you? Um, You wouldn't have it would be a least likely chance. It's almost like this idea of just like a worldly principle. If you scratch my back, I'll scratch. That year. You know, you're good to somebody and they'll be good to you. Um, but I don't see that. I don't really believe that this is the correct way of looking at this in the context of what Peter has said here in the context of the rest of the, the book. I don't believe that's the right way. Um, I think that there's a, a problem with answering that question that way. Who's going to harm you if you're devoted to what is good? If you were to answer that as no one, I think that it puts the focus on man. So if you were to enter into a time of trial, a time of suffering, you might look to yourself or you might look at um, just the worldly percentages, worldly principles, and you might be able to think, well, the odds are good that I won't suffer. So then that behooves me to to take a stand here. You could think it's less likely with my exemplary behavior that I won't be mistreated. So that right there will be my motivation. But all the while, I think that that attitude of looking at ourselves or looking at the world that is taking our focus off of the Lord is putting um, our focus on our own personal conduct by a means by which we might be spared from harm. So the way that I believe that the chapter is laid out here, he just Peter in verse uh, 10 through 12, he just got done quoting Psalms 34. And he says, for the eyes of the Lord are upon the righteous and his ears are upon or open to their prayer. But the Lord's face is against those who do evil. And then in verse number 14, he quotes Isaiah chapter eight. Be not, but do not be terrified of them or be shaken. Um, if you would turn to Isaiah eight and let's look at verse 11. 
so we can look at the context that Peter had in mind when he wrote this. If we look at verse, we can look at verse 11, that's fine. Um, For the Lord spoke thus to me, this is Isaiah speaking, with his strong hand upon me and warned me not to walk in the way of this people, saying, do not call conspiracy all that this people calls conspiracy. And do not fear what they fear, nor be in dread. But the Lord of hosts, him shall you honor as holy. Let him be your fear and let him be your dread. And he will become a sanctuary and a stone of offense and a rock of stumbling to both houses of Israel, a trap and a snare to the inhabitants of Jerusalem. And many shall stumble on it. They shall fall and be broken and they shall be snared and taken. Um, This isn't the first time that Peter has referenced this section of scripture in his book. Um, If you just turn back to first Peter chapter two and look at verse seven. He references this section in Isaiah, for it says in Scripture, look, I lay in Zion a stone, a chosen and priceless cornerstone, and whoever believes in him will never be put to shame. That's Isaiah 28 right there. So you who believe see his value. But for those who do not believe, the stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone and a stumbling stone and a rock to trip over. That right there is where he's quoting once again Isaiah chapter eight. So I think that this shows um, what Peter had in mind when he was writing this. So the question would be, well, why did he have this in mind? He's referencing it twice here. And what's going on in Isaiah chapter seven and eight is you have Ahaz, King wicked Ahaz, who brought in all of his wicked idols and all of his uh, uh, work, worldly worship. He's trying to uh, take the people's focus off of the Lord. He's going to divide this kingdom and the people, they were worried about what Ahaz was going to do. And, In Isaiah chapter 8, verse 11, this right here, what um, Isaiah is referencing, for the Lord spoke to me, um, the Lord told Isaiah what to write, and it was to encourage them in the midst of this this battle, this dividing of the kingdom that was going to to happen here. The reason it was going to happen was because of Ahaz's wickedness, but in the midst of all that, there was going to be judgment, but there was encouragement that was coming to those who were living righteously. And what the encouragement was is to keep your eyes focused on the Lord. Again, quoting um, Isaiah 8, um, it says, Do not fear what they fear, nor be in dread, but the Lord of hosts, him shall you honor as holy. Let him be your fear. The Lord told them in the midst of this dividing of the kingdom that is going to happen. Um, This was actually the second time that this prophecy came. One time in chapter 7, one time in chapter 8. This is going to happen. But even though this is going to happen, do not fear what, what, what you see coming. Um, he gives the imagery of, of this army that's coming like a rushing water. It's going to be like the river Euphrates that's going to come up to the neck of the people. And so the people are trying to find their own way out of it. And God tells them what they have to do. Do not fear them. Let him be your dread. And even in verse 11, I like how Isaiah, uh, the imagery that he gives here, for the Lord spoke to me thus with his hand strong, or with his hand, strong hand upon me. It reminds me of like a, a father and a son, as if I'm going to communicate something very important to my son. I'm going to put my hand on him or look him in the eye and say, listen, and expect his focus to be on me. I, that's how I see this right here. He warned me, he warned me not to walk the way that just people walk. And even as we were saying tonight, I was thinking of just, of, in a way, the fear that Isaiah must have had, though, too. We see the same thing with Jeremiah, how he is a prophet to the people. And so it's almost as if you have one man. I know that there was more than one man, but, I, but I'm saying from a human perspective how it would feel. You have this one guy, and even Isaiah is quoted in uh, Romans 10 for saying this. Um, you know, I'm the only one who's standing up. Everybody else is going the opposite way. I'm the only one. And God said, no, I have reserved for me 7,000 and have not uh, bent the knee to Baal. But just the fear of that man has when they are standing up for doing what God has said. Um, There's a warning there. Um, We can relate to it. I think of all the time, even some different people that I um, have been around lately. They are they have to take a stand for the Lord. I think um, suffering, it comes in. um, It's portioned out by, by the Lord. He had to stand against these armies and, and against this uh, this day of slaughter that was going, going to come. But 
the people that I'm with right now, they're not worried about armies so much coming against them. And I would even say that they're not worried about all of the big social things that are going on. But their suffering is um, either pain or either internal. And what's interesting to me is that the Lord knows how to portion these things out for each of us. So that each of us are almost put into this the same state of helplessness, appearing like helplessness, appearing like hopelessness, so that we must call on the Lord. Um, I thought of this verse, too. Um, turn with me to Second uh, Corinthians chapter 1. This is Paul writing. Talking about what happened to him when he was in Ephesus. We do not want you to be unaware, brothers and sisters, regarding the affliction that happened to us in the province of Asia, that we were burdened excessively beyond our strength. Have you ever been there? Burdened beyond our strength, so that we despaired even of living. I always found that interesting that Paul says that, because it's almost a piece of information that he didn't really have to share. You know, he's the mighty apostle Paul, but he kind of lets you in behind the, the curtain, letting you know how he felt. And again, he's talking for Timothy, and also Luke was with him. Um, This is in Acts 19. It says, Indeed, we felt as if the sentence of death had been passed against us, so that we would not trust in ourselves, but in God who raises the dead. And he did did deliver him from from that trial right there. But it's it's interesting to me just how we can relate with that, that feeling of being just completely overwhelmed by being completely hopeless, That we cannot stand. And I think that God gets us there for that very same reason. So it doesn't matter what the trial is. It doesn't matter what it is that we're facing. In that moment, it really is larger than us. But each of us are expected to have the same response to it, though, which is don't fear that. Fear the Lord. And so going back to our, our our text here, it says, for who is going to harm you if you're devoted to what is good? I think that another good question to ask right there is, what is good? Who's going to harm you if you're devoted to what is good? What is good? Well, looking at verse 12 in chapter 3, for the eyes of the Lord are upon the righteous, and his ears are open to the prayer. So what is good? Doing what is righteous is good. What is good in Isaiah chapter 8? Trusting in the Lord, fearing the Lord, believing the Lord, believing what the Lord has said. And this is being contrasted with the suffering that Peter uh, talks about in 1 Peter uh, 2.20. Uh, for what credit is it when you were, when you were uh, sin and you're beaten for it and you endure it? I mean, certainly that's not what he's talking about here. Is there punishment and that comes upon us when we do sin? Absolutely. But that's not what he's talking about right here. Because he's talking about devoted to what is good. And so the way that I see this, uh, this passage is that it is rhetorical. For who's going to harm you if you're devoted for what is good? But I think that the answer is God won't. I think that is what the answer is. Um, Right here, again, quoting verse 12. The eyes of the Lord upon the righteous, his ears are open to their prayers, but the face of the Lord is against those who do evil. If we're not doing evil and we're doing good, then who's going to harm you? Yeah, everybody else might harm you, but who's not going to harm you? God. In verse 14, but in fact, if you happen to suffer for doing what is right, you are blessed. And again, this is being associated with the suffering that that Christ had. But do not be terrified of them or be shaken. Again, this is quoting Isaiah chapter 8, verse 12. Do not call conspiracy all that this people calls conspiracy. And do not fear what they fear. Well, what did they fear? They have feared the Assyrians that were going to come, and, and, and Ahaz, uh, this is what they feared. But the Lord told them not to fear that. And so it's very interesting to me how uh, First Peter, using you know, something that happened just hundreds of years prior to that, is Peter's able to relate to that and show that it's essentially the exact same thing that's going on. What's going on is the trials that they're going through. Um, of course, 
again. Well, who's First Peter written to? First Peter is written to uh, the 12 tribes that are scattered. Why are they scattered? They're scattered because there is this new thing called being a Christian, and Nero is curing, or killing everybody that happens to be one. So in that regard, there's somewhat um, of the same context. There's murdering of mass groups of people. But because of the uh, submission aspect that we see that's happening in chapter 2 and chapter 3 right here, I don't think that this can only be associated to those who are experiencing some kind of killing. I think that we can even relate to this in our day. And what is it that we're supposed to do? It says, but set Christ apart as Lord in your hearts. Again, that very uh, same thing is said in Isaiah. Um, But honor him as holy. That whole idea of the sanctification, uh, the sanctification aspect of it. Um, In the Septuagint, it says, sanctify the Lord himself, and he himself will be your fear. And so even that, you can see how Peter is drawing uh, from that that verse. And so it's interesting that our hope is in the God that we fear. Uh, We are sanctified. So the question would be, how are we sanctified? What is sanctified? To be sanctified means to, to take something from ordinary use and to cleanse it, to separate it for sacred use. So even Jesus said in John 17, sanctify them in the truth. Your word is truth. As you sent me into the world, so I have sent them into the world, and for their sake I consecrate myself, that they also may be sanctified in truth. And so another question, um, today there is a big I guess you could say movement, I don't know, among um, some younger people, apologetics, this giving the um, uh, a defense for the faith. Um, that's definitely been around for a long time, but it seems like it's picked up more traction. And the way that it's used now, it's different than how this verse is. Not that I'm against how it's done now, but in the context, this right here, this apologetic that is coming out, this defense of giving an answer, it is giving an answer to those who ask of you. The way that it's used now a lot of times is on the offense. That's almost like you're taking the battle to them. Now, we definitely should evangelize, and there's plenty there for us to interact with other people. But in the context of this verse right here, it's about giving a defense for what it is that you believe. Vody Balkum says uh, in his book, Expository Apologetics, in his day, Isaiah told the people not to fear the invading Assyrian armies, but to revere God in his epistle to revere God. In his epistle, Peter has the same encouraging message. In light of the context, it is clear that Peter is not calling for, for, I said for, I've been south too long, for a mere spiritual devotion to Christ, though that is certainly in view, but a choice to honor Christ in a culture that opposes and even punishes, punishes such devotion. And I think more and more, as the time goes on, we're going to see more of this, of taking a stand Um, for a culture, in a culture that opposes Christ. Being reminded of what Jesus said in Matthew 10, 28. Do not be afraid of those who kill the body, but cannot kill the soul. Instead, fear the one who is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. So apologetics is ultimately our expression of our willingness to suffer rather than to compromise. Both in terms of why we suffer and how we suffer, apologetics is the answer to those at whose hands we suffer, as well as those who wit- or as well as those whose witness we are suffering. Apologetics says to a watching world, "We have been captured by something so profound that we are willing not only to be considered fools, but also to suffer as such." That is essentially what apologetics is. So the next question could really be, who is, um, uh, who did Peter have in mind to give this apologetic? Who is it, who is commanded to, to give an answer? Is it merely for church leaders and for these elite Christians, those who have just spent countless hours in the word? There would be a yes to that. Hopefully we would try to spend time in the word and, and spend time with the Lord, but this right here, it's for everybody. If we were to consider ourselves as being a Christian, if we were to consider ourselves as being redeemed by God, then this is who he's talking about. That we should set Christ apart as Lord in our hearts.
John Gill, I thought it was interesting in his commentary, he says that he thinks that uh, uh, Jesus Christ was the, the actual focus of who Isaiah was, was even writing about. Um, he uses Acts, um, I think it's 4.11 to, to use that. Um, that's really not important, but he sees that when it's talking about the rock that they're going to trip over, it's talking primarily about Jesus Christ, and that is who Isaiah had in mind. So for tonight, I just wanted to uh, kind of address that question of who is going to harm you if you're devoted to what is good. I think it drastically makes a difference in how we read this. If we just see it as um, people or if we see it as not being God. If, if we approach a situation knowing that there can be suffering or even in the midst of suffering, and we worry about all of these external factors, you know. It's taking our focus off of God. I think that it gives us great peace, even in the midst of suffering, to be able to know that our suffering is portioned by God. It's for our good. It's for His glory. And even if there is a temporary suffering aspect that we do have to go through, we don't have to suffer eternally that even the suffering that we do uh, participate in, it is to mold us. It is to shape us. It is to, to change us, even as Romans 12 says, to change and renew our minds. And I think that that gives us a peace to know that um, all these things are done by the hand of the Lord. And it's not the Lord that is going to um, ultimately commit eternal punishment on us. And so... Um, that's all I had for tonight. So let's pray. Lord God, we love you. God, we're thankful for your word. God, we're thankful for your faithfulness. Lord, I pray that you would help us to be faithful in suffering. In Jesus' name, amen.